my dear beloved brethren and sisters in Christ, gathered in a very unusual way, with no borders or restrictions from all over the world, all those accepting this invitation of the dear beloved brethren from South Africa to attend this South African General Convention of 2022. We are very happy and delighted to have a part and opportunity to join this blessed gathering and fellowship. We bring with us the warmest Christian love and greetings from brethren in various parts of India. There are many states in India where you have brethren and ecclesias, so I'd rather mention the states. There are many ecclesias in the state of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, then there is Kerala, Mumbai, and North India, and Punjab in particular, where various ecclesias of Indian saints are. They send their love and greetings to each and every one of you, dear fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We also bring to you loving greetings from Singapore and the Ecclesia there, and Myanmar, and the Ecclesias there, and Brother Nang Nang So, and saints in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Benin, and other places in Africa. So brethren, lots of love from brethren all over the world and from various continents to the convention here. Let us begin our thoughts today, which will be entitled, Some Insights into the Life and Ministry of the Great Apostle Paul. Yes, as we are aware that the theme text of this convention is from the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So we thought we would speak a few words concerning this great apostle and his example. And our theme text for these thoughts is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 8 to 10. Let's read the theme text. Then last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not made to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now this is a self-testimony given in all humility by the great apostle concerning his receiving his apostleship as the one who Jesus selected to replace the fallen apostle Judas Iscariot. Let's read this in Acts chapter 9 verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Here it is the Lord Jesus himself giving testimony of the selection of Saul of Tarsus to be a chosen vessel unto me. We know of this great truth of how one of the originally selected 12 being later replaced by another being shown in symbol 
in the book of Revelation and chapter 7 where the 12 tribes of spiritual Israel shown there in verses 5 to 8 are symbolized by the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. But a big difference is shown. Dan, one of the sons of Jacob and a tribe is missing is replaced there by Manasseh who was not in any way one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. Brethren, this of course picturizes the replacement of the apostle Judas Iscariot by Saul of Tarsus who became the great apostle Paul in spiritual Israel among the 12 apostles. Now, in our study today, we wish to look into some insights into the life and ministry of this great Apostle Paul. And we hope and believe it will be a blessing to all. Let us begin. Our first subtitle is In the Beginning. Uh, yes, we begin by seeing... Saul of Tarsus, who as a Jew was very zealous for God and his law. Yes, he gives his own self testimony in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Men, brethren, and fathers, Hear ye my defence, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that, he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them. They kept the most silence, and he said, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law, of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear. I'm going to stop there because he continues to explain how he uh, persecuted the church and how he came into the light of truth, but. Uh, my my part over there in that reading was concerning his zeal as a Jew, as Saul of Tarsus. Now, his zeal was so pronounced that we have another scripture where it is believed that he was one of those who was involved in the confrontation with uh, Simon, so with uh, Stephen, the church's blessed first martyr he had strong disputings arguments with stephen let's read in acts chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. acts chapter 6 9 and 10 and then there were there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the libertines and of them of cilicia disputing with Stephen. Now note those words and of them of Cilicia. Remember earlier Acts 22 and verse 3 we saw the Apostle Paul testifying he was born in Tarsus a city in Cilicia. Brother Russell comments in EBC page 29 for this Acts 6 9 and those words of them of Cilicia by saying possibly including Saul of Tarsus. Uh, reprint 2952, reprint 5858. Indeed, verse 10 tells us of the wisdom and spirit by which Stephen spoke, which caused these Jews to become very angry, including, we believe, Saul of Tarsus. Now, this led speedily to the uh, immediate circumstances leading to the martyrdom of Stephen. Yes, Saul 
who was in full agreement and support of that death sentence by stoning. Let us read two scriptures concerning this. Acts chapter 7 and verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So you see there? Now read another scripture in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So, dear brethren, you see very clearly the scriptural testimony that uh, Saul was in full agreement and support of that death sentence by stoning for the first blessed martyr, Stephen. Further, we read that after the death of Stephen, that Saul was a terrible persecutor of the early church. We read in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. As for Saul, he met havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Can you imagine the, the zeal by which he did that? Uh, the scripture says made havoc, havoc of the church. Now the word havoc is uh, Greek concordance number 3075 and the word is lumai nomai and it means to devastate, to insult, to maltreat. Yes, Saul of Tarsus in his zeal for the law of God misunderstood the early church and severely persecuted them and was also uh, in agreement for the stoning to death of the church's first blessed martyr Stephen. That was Saul of Tarsus. Let's go to the second subtitle of our subject today and that is the selection and making of the Apostle Paul as the replacement of the fallen apostle Judas Iscariot. Now this is described in much detail in Acts the ninth chapter, including his experience of becoming blinded caused by the brilliant light burning and damaging both his eyes and his retinas. Let us read in Acts chapter nine, Verse 8 and 9. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. If you note the words of this scripture, it's rather amazing that after this experience of meeting the Lord, not only was he blinded in the sense that his eyes uh, could not see, he could not eat and drink water for three days. Can you imagine the brilliant experience that Saul had? Now, we read that subsequently uh, the Lord arranged that uh, Saul would receive back his sight miraculously through the disciple Ananias. We read of this in Acts chapter 9, verse 17 and 18. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So what do you think, dear brethren, happened there? Well, have you ever seen a blind man 
and you looked at his eyes, there's some sort of a kind of a white skin covering the retina, the eyeball. Well, something like that must have happened uh, for Saul after the experience of seeing the brilliant light uh, of the Lord Jesus. And uh, it required something miraculous to restore his sight. And so that, that, that kind of skin that covered the retina uh, kind of fell off. It was the scales that fell off. His, the thin layer of skin that caused the blinding kind of fell off and opened his eyeballs again. Now you can read about this in Brother Russell's comments in Acts 9 and 18 on page 38 of the EBC book concerning the scales and uh, it's about what we are talking about. Now we have to remember here one important thing and that is despite this miraculous healing uh, that the Lord sent Ananias to do to Saul of Tarsus, uh, it was not a full restoration of his sight. We must keep that in mind. That it was a partial restoration of his sight. How do we know this? Well, we know it through various other scriptures. Uh, it was an affliction that he had, this partial healing of his eyesight. So much so in history, he is referred to as the bleary-eyed Jew. Yes, a reference from the historian at that time who was Josephus. Now, this led the Apostle Paul not being able to write his own letters. He needed a amanuensis, a secretary, to write the words that he would dictate. Uh, you can see that quite evident in some of the letters when it begins. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother. Now who is Sosthenes our brother? Well, he is the amanuensis who is writing the letter or, or noting down the words that Paul is dictating to him. We have another reference in 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. So here again, we would assume that the second letter to the Corinthians, uh, Paul used Timothy as amanuensis or secretary to write down his words. We go now to 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we would say it's Silvanus with Timotheus. They're helping the Apostle Paul in recording the letter, first letter to the Thessalonican church. Now there were only two letters that the Apostle wrote himself uh, with uh, great difficulty. These letters were the letters to the Galatians and the letter of Philemon. You can see that right away when you look at two scriptures, one in Galatians and one in Philemon. Let's read Galatians 6 verse 11. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. You see, he's talking about how large a letter. It could be big letters, like he had to look close like this and write. Or it could be, look how big a letter I've actually written by myself. Now, we read in Philemon 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me even thine own self beside. Now, why does he have to 
uh, say I have written by my own hand because that's not his normal way of writing letters. Normally, he would write a letter using an amanuensis, a brother, a co-brother, and that's how he would write his letters. But it was very, very special in the case of these two letters, the letter to the Galatians and the letter to Philemon. Now, the letter to the to Philemon was more of a personal letter of request by the aged, by that time aged Apostle Paul on behalf of a disciple called Onesimus who was an escaped slave from the home of uh, Philemon who was an elder in the church of Colossae, in the Colossian church. And he was now returning having run away as a slave, returning as a converted brother in Christ. So it required Paul to uh, prepare Philemon to receive this absolutely unbelievable, wonderful information and how he would react to that. So that was the letter of Philemon. Now, the Galatians letter is, on the other hand, where the apostle kind, kind of sits down to give his personal testimony of how he came into the light of truth. You know, brethren, in the uh, letter to the Galatians, we have some very, very vital points of information, which we would do well to look into. Uh, first of all, Galatians 1, the first chapter, of and the first 12 verses, verses 1 to 12, uh, details how Paul became an apostle. You remember an apostle is one who is an eyewitness to the gospel message from Jesus and becomes then a sent, a messenger from Jesus of that gospel. Now, how did Paul, yes, the Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, how did he receive that gospel from Jesus? Well, in that first chapter, verses 1 to 12, uh, the Apostle explains. And we read that in uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. So you see that the apostle is telling us, very, very, very clearly telling us that uh, he received the gospel not from a man not from a human being. No, he did not even receive the apostle from any, did receive the gospel from any apostles either. He received the gospel from the glorified Jesus. And where did he receive it? He received it in Arabia over three years. That's about the time that the other apostles received the gospel in the fellowship of Jesus before his death from his baptism and before his death. Yes, in Arabia, that is where he received. What a, what a unusual selection of a place for Paul to receive the gospel from the glorified Jesus. Can you imagine when this gospel becomes known to all the world and the Muslims to whom Arabia is a very, very sacred place. And when they come to the light of truth and they realize that God used Arabia as a location for the glorified Jesus over three years to give the gospel to the Apostle Paul. Wow. <laughs> now, uh, after that, we read that Apostle Paul went up to uh, before we go to before we go to that, I, I mean, how exactly did 
Paul received the gospel during those three years from the glorified Jesus. What kind of an experience of learning did he have? Uh, interestingly, uh, he doesn't mention it here, but he mentions it in another place in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now it's really wonderful how the apostles, when they refer to themselves, don't say me or I, they, they, they speak in the third person. So this man in Christ, the apostle Paul is writing about here, is himself. And the visions and revelations refer to how he received the gospel from the glorified Jesus, who was his teacher and rabbi. And uh, he received wonderful knowledge that it was not permitted for him to record all that. Now, you know, teachers today, they use various tools to present their presentations. For example, you have something called the PPT or the PowerPoint these days. It wouldn't be wrong to say that the greatest teacher of all, our Lord Jesus, while he was giving the gospel and teaching the Apostle Paul, he used what could be called vision point, in which he presented the divine plan to the Apostle from past, present, and future through visions in such vivid reality that the apostle testified whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. He was given stirring visions of the third heaven. Yes from its opening in 1874 to the 20th and the 21st centuries that we know of and extending into the future. Yes, the millennial kingdom till 2874. What a mesmerizing experience the apostle had. That's what he's trying to say here. It was such an experience that he could not even explain it. But he was actually transported to those places which he was seeing in vision. Or whether he was looking at a vision. He couldn't know the difference. It was so vivid and mesmerizing. Well, coming back to the book of Galatians and his personal testimony. We read that after those three years in Arabia, he went to Jerusalem and first met with the Apostle Peter. Galatians 1.18. I won't be reading for want of time. Now we go next. He says that he met only with another Apostle and that is Apostle James, the Lord's brother. He's actually not the James who is the brother of John. This is James, the son of Alphaeus. He's called James the Less. He is actually the Lord's brother. Uh, we can read in Galatians 1. Uh, no, I'll read it in uh, Mark 15, 40. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome. Now there's another wonderful truth hidden there is that this is this is Mary not the mother of Jesus 
but uh, Mary who was uh, in the home of Jesus and uh, there were two Marys in the home of Jesus it's a great a uh, very astonishing truth which you could study in another in another study which we have prepared called here a little and there a little and James uh, is the uh, uh, the son of Alphaeus or, or the brother of Joseph and Joseph dies and uh, uh, the leverate marriage arrangement causes uh, Joseph to have to give a heir to the uh, to the wife of his dead brother and uh, this wife is also called Mary, and and that's that's another subject altogether. But but there is James, Apostle James, James the Less, the son of Alphaeus, uh, who is the second person that Paul meets after having completed his three years in Arabia. Now we go to uh, the last verse in Galatians, Galatians one twenty. Uh, by the way, Galatians 1.19 is that matter which I pointed out to you. Uh, we go to Galatians 1.20. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. It seems like the apostle is saying that this is a true testimony. It's like he's putting a signature to that. He is confirming that all this, what he's writing of, is absolutely true and that ends chapter 1 of Galatians as you go into chapter 2 of Galatians you he sees we see the Apostle explaining his ministry as the Apostle to the Gentiles including an incident where he had to confront to the face the Apostle Peter for hypocrisy in the matter of acceptance of Gentiles into fellowship into the body of Christ along with the Jews who were the first to enter into the body of Christ. Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 to 14. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compelest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now, dear brethren, this was a very difficult matter to be understood by the Jewish Christians, especially after having received the exclusive call earlier from the God of Israel for three and a half years. The church was only Jewish for three and a half years. And it seemed like the church was only going to be Jewish, according to their understanding. And Peter, who was sent to open the door, so to speak, or open the key to the Gentiles in the home of Cornelius and his family, when he came back from that ministry, uh, he had a lot of explaining to do to rather angry Jewish disciples in Jerusalem. It's all very strange, dear brethren. But we read it in the scriptures. Acts chapter 11, you can read it, verses 1 to 18. Uh, you can see there how, from verses 1 onwards, there was this uh, matter which... Uh, required a lot of explaining of Peter to do to make them understand that in God's plan it was now uh, the church was opening or the church opportunity and fellowship was opening also to the Gentiles according to God's will. Now uh, another interesting bit of information is found in Galatians chapter 4 
We read verses 13 to 15. Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 to 15. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but... Now here is Paul referring to something called a temptation which was in my flesh. Uh, incidentally, he calls the same affliction in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 as a thorn as a thorn uh, in the flesh the messenger of satan what was this well dear brethren in addition to his partial recovery of his eyesight it is said that his eyes were so afflicted by that experience that a watery substance kept you know flowing from his eyes that his eyes would spew forth a watery liquid all the time so that he had to he had to kind of be wiping quite quite regularly while making a presentation which was which is very difficult it was very shabby and it caused uh, it, it 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 caused a lot of embarrassment it was a matter of weakness uh, for the great apostle while he was presenting the powerful word of god and we get this thought again when we see him speaking in second corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10 For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. What do you mean by that? You mean that it means that when he was making this presentation, you know, talking and going like this, like this, like this, like this, like this again and again, and the flowing of uh, a liquid, it was, it was as it said contemptible now this caused uh, this caused such a feeling in the apostle that he beseeched the lord three times three times to heal him of this malady we read that in second corinthians chapter 12 verse 8 and 9 for this thing i besought the lord thrice and it might depart from me and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Well, he went to the Lord and told the Lord, Lord, you work such great miracles in me towards others. I'm having this difficulty with this affliction. You can make it go away. Lord, if it is your will, please deliver me from this. And the Lord says, no, it's okay. Let it be. And, uh, you know, brethren, uh, in, 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 in Galatians chapter 4, we read, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Galatians 4.15 Where is then the blessedness he spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, he would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. How? What, what kind of an insight is this? Have you seen that, dear brethren? The great apostle Paul, doing this great ministry of God and the truth in the churches, had this experience. And the Lord said, it's okay. I am with you. The Lord did not necessarily take it away from him. He continued with that malady. Yes, the great apostle Paul, the greatest of the apostles, the angel to the church of Ephesus. Now, dear brethren, 
concerning his ministry you know there is much that we have all heard down the years his three missionary journeys his last voyage to rome as found in the book of acts and recorded by the faithful dr luke but we will not be going into that because that that's already um, covered a lot which we would have received in the past we're moving on to our third subtitle a particular strong trial of the apostle paul while there were many trials that the apostle faced we would like to touch on a rather obscure trial and try to cast some light on it yes it is found in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 to 10 for we would not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in god which raised the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us what astounding words what strong words dear brethren we were pressed out of measure you could say we had a terrible experience above strength it was unbearable so that we despaired even of life it seemed to be the end of everything what was this matter what was the cause of this great and terrible experience that paul is describing here if we look at the ebc and the comments of brother russell and page 322 brother russell writes our trouble it may have been the intention to have the apostle cast into the arena to be devoured by wild beasts first corinthians 5 32 sorry 1532 or it is possible or it is possible that he referred to the efficient mob itself as beasts seeking his life reprint 2207 well brother russell in his comments seems to have interpreted first corinthians 1532 and left this verse with no comments at all yes brethren go through that and you will think about it and you'll understand that so thus we have seen something uh, i mean sorry uh, thus we have something very interesting to share by way of comments to you dear brethren as to what was this matter causing so deep distress to the apostle if you were to search the word asia yes the word asia if you were to the, use that as a keyword and search in the letters of paul you would only find three texts and those three texts tell a story yes a very interesting insight into what the apostle is speaking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8 and the distressing trial incidentally a search for asia in the new testament as a whole yields 20 texts 14 from acts 3 from paul's letters 1 from peter in first peter and two in revelation that's just statistical information but for our answer to the question we are looking at the three texts in the writings of paul now let us look at the at the matter of the text before that i'll mention the text to you first corinthians 16 19 second corinthians 1 8 which we are looking at now and second timothy 1 15 now 
When you look at the matter in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, let's read it. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now please note dear brethren, the apostle is giving the warm and loving greetings from the churches of Asia. Even Aquila and Priscilla and even the church of Antioch. That's what we get from this particular scripture. Now the second text is 2 Corinthians 1.8 which we are trying to find out what the distress is. The final text is 2 Timothy 1.15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now this is rather astounding. The word all they which are in Asia, all, that word is Greek 3956 and it's pronounced I think pass and pass or pass means everyone, the whole. Yes, the same churches who had earlier sent warm loving greetings to the Apostle Paul, even the church at Antioch were now many years later rejecting and persecuting the Apostle Paul. My dear brethren, only the family of Onesiphorus, it would seem, gave comfort to the Apostle at this time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 16 to 18. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, and found me. The Lord grant unto him, that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. What could have been the reason for this turning away of all the churches in Asia from the Apostle Paul? It apparently was very painful for the great Apostle as we read in another scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So brethren, three texts concerning Asia. And we are led to believe and suggest to you, dear brethren, that this whole experience of all they which be in Asia be turned away from me was such a painful experience that the Apostle experienced deep despair which he writes about in 2 Corinthians 1 8 to 10. Of course he does write that it was the Lord who finally delivered him from that distress. Oh yes, only those who have labored to establish churches and raise up spiritual children like the Apostle and then much later experience how some of those children turn against them for selfish self-seeking purposes and reasons can understand this deep pain and despair of the Apostle and finally God only was able to comfort him. Oh yes, dear brethren, the scriptures and the prophetic words of our master bear testimony of such developments. Let's look at Matthew 10, 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. 
and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Yes, dear brethren, all through the age, and especially now at the end of the age, it's going to happen. Extremely heart-wrenching, distressing developments among the brethren. Again, we find this in Mark 13, 12, which I'm not going to read. Indeed, much food for thought, dear brethren. Now we go to the fourth and final sub text subtitle of our thoughts today and that is the apostles last days of his earthly journey finally we wish to point out to something interesting here which will conclude these thoughts today let us read from acts chapter 28 30 and 31 and paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. These are the last two verses of the book of Acts in which the beloved Dr. Luke concludes his testimony concerning the Apostle Paul. Now this was just before his execution in Rome. Yes, two whole years in which he stayed in a rented apartment and met any who came to him to discuss matters concerning the gospel of the kingdom and the kingdom of God. There is one instance described in Acts 28, 22 to 24. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning the sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Oh yes, he spent the whole day meeting people interested to hear the good news of the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom. Now we must conclude with some very interesting insights into these verses by the seventh angel, our beloved brother Russell. We turn to the biblical comments for Acts 28, 30 and verse 30 and page 91 of the comments where he writes his own hired house apartment reprint 3208 it was here that Paul wrote the epistles to the Philippians Galatians Ephesians Colossians and to Philemon reprint 3208 reprint 1570 it is possible that his necessities were met by his friends or that by this time he had inherited considerable patrimony from his father's estate. Yes, uh, proceeds from his father's property which he received by inheritance. Reprint 3208, reprint 2969. Again, implying that Paul inherited a patrimony that enabled him to live with numerous conveniences enjoyed at that time only by the wealthy. Reprint 4355. Our brethren, it is rather astonishing that we get this, these insights from the seventh angel. Remember, in the two feedings, which represent the Lord's two uh, comings, the beginning of the calling of the new creation in the first coming and then at his second coming. Uh, you know, in the two feedings, you have the gathering of the crumbs, first 12 baskets, that's the 12 apostles that are used to uh, bring forth the Lord's message, the gospel of the kingdom. You have the second feeding, there are seven baskets representing how the seven angels, are used to bring forth further 
deeper insight into the gospel of the kingdom. And here's our beloved brother Russell giving us insights into the into these two verses and especially verse number 30 of Acts 28. Uh, uh, giving us understanding uh, of uh, uh, this particular verse from the point of view of how those two full years the apostle spent this time in his own hired house, in his own rented apartment. Now the great apostle Paul ends his years of ministry as the greatest apostle and the angel of the church of Ephesus in the relative quietness of his own rented apartment, yes, his own hired house, where his service would continue unto death as found in that last verse of the writing of Dr. Luke in the book of Acts, yes, Acts 28, 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Yes, that's how the book of Acts ends and the final words of the beloved Dr. Luke concerning the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. And it was here too that he penned those final words, we believe, which he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Ah, yes. Utter faithfulness in humility. Yes, dear brethren, we hope these insights into the life and ministry of the great Apostle Paul was a blessing. May the Lord add his blessings to his holy words. Amen.